We're going to bring on uh, Lisa DiPinto. Uh, Lisa is a senior scientist at NOAA's Office of uh, Response and Restoration. Um, she was uh, the chief scientist and case team coordinator for NOAA's uh, Deepwater Horizon Natural Resource Damage Assessment. And I, for one, can comment that I, I was in Homa myself, and I do remember seeing Lisa and others there very late at night, uh, very stressed out, <laughs> as most people were there. And uh, I, I commend her for, for, the, for the job uh, that she did down there, where they actually settled um, for uh, $8 billion in damages. That's B, $8 billion. Um, she's been with NOAA for over 20 years. Uh, she designed, coordinated, and implemented assessments nationally and internationally. And Lisa is going to talk about uh, characterizing oil in the water, on the water, and beneath a slick, or sciencing at the Santa Barbara seep site, which is very familiar. Um, my name is Lisa Pinto. You got my introductions. I'm with NOAA's Office of Response and Restoration. I'm going to talk today about two projects that we have underway to characterize oil in the water column, beneath the slick, um, and also some work that complements that looking at uh, using remote sensing tools to characterize the slick simultaneously. Uh, and as you guys know, anyone that's uh, worked with us knows that these projects are all really the result of a collaborative effort. Uh, among so many different uh, researchers. Uh, these are some of the highlights for the two projects that I am about to talk about. And I'm always afraid I've left someone off, so I put the uh, many more at the bottom. But thank you all for the partnership, the funding, and the science uh, know-how. Um, these two projects that I'm going to talk about both had field trials at the Santa Barbara SEEP site. Uh, which is why I think I was asked to speak about them at this conference. So the first project is an oldie but a goodie. Um, you've probably heard about it before, maybe uh, when I spoke about uh, spoke to you guys in 2019. But the title of the project is Three-Dimensional Mapping of Dissolved Hydrocarbons and Oil Droplets Using a Remus AUP. And this project was funded by Bessie, and I worked closely with Jay Cho. Um, it has been completed, and the final report has been posted in two locations, uh, one at uh, UNH's CRRC uh, box site at the top, and the other is at the BSEE uh, website where they post all their uh, projects. Uh, so just didn't want to forget that. But the goal of this project was to uh, work to develop a Remus 600 um, modular system that would allow us to characterize oil in the water column. Um, moving beyond uh, just fluorometry. So we wanted to have kind of an integrated system um, that I'll describe in the next slide. Uh, and then we wanted to use this system to map oil in the water column. And we wanted to also test it uh, with synoptic uh, drone-based surface oil mapping. Uh, so we worked uh, with Hui on the Remus 600 development. We worked with Oscar Garcia water mapping. Uh, with a multispectral uh, sensor uh, system mounted on a drone uh, off of a Coast Guard vessel. You'll see in the bottom pick these two pictures here. Uh, the Coast Guard was uh, working, uh, was offered us the use of the George Cobb, uh, and uh, we graciously took them, we took them up on their gracious offer, gave us plenty of deck space and plenty of crew and uh, a good opportunity to integrate oil spill operations with the Coast Guard. Uh, so that was a great uh, collaboration. And then we worked with uh, NOAA's uh, spatial data branch, George Grettinger and others, um, uh, to develop data outputs, faster workflows, uh, faster data delivery into common operational pictures. Many of you are familiar with NOAA's um, Environmental Response Management Application, or IRMA. Data can be stored and viewed also in the diver site. Um, and as I mentioned, the field trials were, were uh, conducted at the Santa Barbara Sea area. Um, so what we did was we developed uh, a modular system uh, using the Remus uh, vehicle, and uh, Hui took the lead on that. Amy Kukulia was the project lead that I uh, coordinated most of the work with, and uh, she worked to develop a miniaturized holographic camera and a water sampler that uh, was a modular water sample. You can see it's pictured here on the right, and it contains cartridges that contain six one-liter water sampling bottles that uh, can be then 
uh, triggered through um, pattern sampling that I'll talk about in a future slide. You can collect up to six discrete water samples guided by your fluorometry or other uh, sensor needs. And then you can surface the vehicle, swap out the cartridge, add another cartridge in and, you know, and send it back down for six more uh, discrete water samples. Uh, so that was something novel. And uh, these, uh, this system can be swapped out and used in other uh, autonomous vehicles. And uh, my understanding is that it has been used in other vehicles for eDNA sampling and other types of water sampling uh, on other projects. We also equipped it with CTD, DO, GoPro, and uh, a, a Sea Owl fluorometer uh, to look at um, FDOM, um, um, but, uh, optical backsp backscatter, and uh, chlorophyll. So, and you can see here up front uh, in the nose, this is the holographic camera where it's imaging water as it passes through the sensors. Uh, we also, so there, there's your top shelf, uh, but we also were working with EPA and water mapping to develop something a little more portable and a little uh, easier to use. I always joke, it's so easy that even I can use it. Um, that is really setting the bar pretty low. Um, and uh, we've got this system uh, working with Robin Conley at EPA and Oscar, as I mentioned. And this is portable. You can put it in a small suitcase size uh, carrying container and bring it on a plane with you and deploy it. It's tethered over the side. We've used it for fluorometry. Um, it's got uh, a, a, an option to add on a, a discrete water sampling uh, component where you can collect up to two discrete one liter samples guided by fluorometry reading. So if you wanna collect a sample above a certain fluorometry reading, you can trigger it um, to collect a sample or perhaps you wanna collect a background sample and you wanna make sure you're below a certain fluorometry level, you can trigger it to collect a, 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 what I call a guided water sample. So we also simultaneously tested uh, this uh, this um, ROV, uh, just highlighting, you know, we're interested in developing different tools for different jobs. Obviously, this smaller device would be used on a very different spill than something like the Remus 600. And then because uh, we're super collaborators, uh, we uh, Amy Kukulia also brought out a Remus 100 that we've tested at a site in the Gulf of Mexico and that she's tested in other places. And we coordinated with the ADAC LRAP um, project, the long range AUV um, as added complementary uh, capabilities. And essentially what we were looking for, in addition to, you know, overboarding these and testing them, we used these other two uh, AUV systems as I consider it kind of a pre-screening to guide us for where we wanted to uh, deploy the Remus 600 uh, when it was time to actually do the test for that. So the Remus 100, you know, it's small. It's probably about 100 pounds. You can uh, throw that over the, gently put that over the side of a vessel. Uh, and we had this one equipped with the CL fluorometer, ADCP, and uh, sonar. Uh, so, and you can see at the bottom here, uh, here's an example of where we are in kind of an oil and gas area. And it was kind of pre-screening of where we deployed one of our Remus 600 runs. And the LRAV, um, much larger. It was a land-based deployment and it uh, operated continuously for six days uh, before, during, and after we were out on the Coast Guard vessel with the CL fluorometer. And it too was kind of pre-screening areas uh, with elevated hydrocarbons. And here's just an example of what some of the readout you get from the LRAP. So it was a mission that had complementary underwater uh, vehicles all working kind of in tandem and in uh, coordination. Uh, the operational workflow, uh, we developed an operational workflow that actually worked. Um, that doesn't always happen, but uh, our plan was to fly the uh, sensor package uh, mounted on UAS. Uh, and Oscar has developed this really cool system to give us real-time data streams. So anyone that um, uh, could access uh, cell service on their phones or on a device, you could see the real-time data stream through a YouTube channel that Oscar put together specifically for this mission. And so everybody could see the same thing in real time. Uh, and then we would capture that imagery. We would immediately, upon landing of the uh, UAS, would load it into the common operational picture and use it to inform the AUV mission. And then uh, based on that, you know, we were trying to uh, both uh, coordinate 
with the other uh, underwater vehicle pre-screening locations and then position ourselves beneath the slick using the remote sensing data and we would deploy the remus to those identified target areas based on those data streams and then we would collect and transfer the data into the uh, common operational picture as it you know was was able to be uploaded you know at different timing for different types of data streams and we kind of describe the workflow and the timing of that in our report uh, over the five days that we were on the water, we uh, we did 19 separate missions, and we programmed the Remus. And by we, when I say we, I always mean someone else. Uh, I'm just kind of overseeing and, and sort of facilitating the research. Um, but our software engineers were able to develop um, uh, programs for different search and gulp uh, patterns, and by gulp we mean collect a water sample pattern. So we would go out to an area of interest, mow the lawn, do up and down yo-yo patterns, and we would either have, you know, a program to collect a water sample if uh, um, fluorometry reading exceeded a certain level, for example, or we would have, uh, we had to go find, um, uh, or we had a, an adaptive sampling uh, a pattern called circle spiral gulp where if you found an elevated uh, reading you would uh, circle around that reading that area in the water column up and down the water column uh, at different elevations or different depths and then at the highest reading within that strip in the water column we it would automatically take a sample there or there was a non-adaptive sampling goal where you would just pre-program it before it left and say here go to this point and collect a sample there so we tested a bunch of different adaptive sampling uh, software algorithms, and they all were executed successfully. So that was a, a big uh, success. And then we also worked with EPA, Alex Hall and Robin Conmey to develop um, different ways of um, visualizing the data. And here's just an example of a 3D interpolation of the data. Uh, and what you're seeing here uh, it's a 3D Krieging technique that estimates optical backscatter chlorophyll and uh, FDOM readings continuously, color-coded. Um, each time step in the video represents, I'm looking at my note here, one meter uh, estimations. And what you see is where you see the uh, circular pattern here, the circle spiral gulp, is this was the highest uh, level of um, FDOM reading in the water column. And so the uh, you'll see it'll turn red there. And so it was automatically triggered to collect a sample there. So it spiraled and collected a data point there. So uh, a really cool way to uh, do create uh, data um, visualization. So the reports, as I mentioned, are available two places online, and that uh, links are available on my web on the uh, first slide. Um, and then I'm going to transition into a second project, which would be uh, a project we did uh, with. Both of these projects were facilitated by uh, the CRRC with Nancy Kinner. Um, this second project, tracking and assessing oil spill toxicity to aquatic organisms using a novel approach, um, was uh, done with uh, G. Allen Burton and his uh, team at uh, University of Michigan. Um, we also work with uh, Coastal Monitoring Associates and the Naval Information Warfare Center in the Pacific, uh, water mapping, PA, et cetera. Uh, so this project, uh, was one where we wanted to develop and test an in-situ drifting bioassay system for evaluating exposure and injury at the surface mixing layer um, uh, at oil spill sites. It kind of was a tiering of some lessons learned from the Deepwater Horizon injury assessment and injury quantification. We found that we had some of our highest estimates of injury in the shallow surface mixing layer, either directly adjacent to or directly beneath a slick. That also happens to be where a high level of biological activity is, and especially early life stages of fish and invertebrates. Uh, lab testing could get to, you know, answer a lot of questions about, you know, if you take measured concentrations in the uh, from uh, and uh, from the field and do lab tests. That does answer some questions about toxicity, but we wondered uh, if we could create a system that drifted with an oil slick with the organisms suspended in chambers beneath to kind of get a more uh, uh, environmentally realistic exposure scenario. So that's what we worked uh, with uh, the team on. Uh, we tested uh, three species, top smelt, sheepshead larvae, and mycids in combination of both embryos and juveniles. Uh, and we uh, work with Alan Burton. He kind of already had a system developed uh, that was stationary, but not one that was um, 
designed to drift with uh, an exposure situation like an oil spill. So uh, we rigged it up with fluorometry, passive samplers, and we also uh, collected some discrete water samples uh, using that ROV I showed you in some previous slides. And again, we paired it with a multispectral UAS system to characterize the surface oiling conditions that the uh, be drifting in, and we again uh, conducted our tests in uh, Santa Barbara. Here's just a, a little bit about the system. It was a combination of both a C-ring carousel that uh, Alan had worked with before. This has kind of been established and is usually a stationary system with chambers for uh, organisms for uh, exposures in the field. Uh, and we tied it with uh, this uh, this uh, ring here, this dro dro uh, droved system with a GPS on top, um, and it has a um, drogue uh, sock to cover it up with a hole in it and a vertical support with a depth adjustment line that allows you to expose your organisms at different uh, depths beneath the surface. Um, and here's what it looks like deployed in the water, and then we've got the ROV right next to it collecting some water samples. Uh, and the proof of concept involved uh, a lot of proof of concept, but what I'm going to talk about is our 24-hour deployment at the Santa Barbara Seep area. We had two DEER systems. One uh, was a reference system, which was intended to be deployed outside of any uh, oil slicks. And then one was the test DEER that was, you know, de deployed inside of an oil slick that we had detected using the, um, the drone system. So we, we deployed them. We allowed them to drift for 24 hours. Uh, we collected some water samples uh, next to each of them at the time of deployment for analysis of exposure. And then um, we also had passive samplers mounted on there so we can get a time-weighted average of, uh, of the uh, exposure as well. So uh, the kind of data we got, we can track the trajectories because they were GPS, continuous uh, PAH 50 exposure, you know, some standard water column stuff. And then once we retrieved the um, organisms, we returned them to the lab uh, and looked at um, their um, delayed toxicity endpoints uh, for uh, not up to 96 hours post-exposure. And I mentioned we also collected water samples. So uh, what, what did this look like? Uh, the green uh, uh, line here represents the reference gear system and the direction that it, um, it uh, floated in for 24 hours, deployed here and ending here. And then the test slick uh, was deployed, uh, the test slick deer uh, was deployed in an oil slick and drifted in the opposite direction. And then again, you can just see sort of what the what the system looks like in the water. Uh, and um, what we found upon uh, recovery was that uh, overnight the currents shifted and the reference deer did end up making its way into some oil and out of some oil because when we retrieved it the next day, it had uh, oil on the outside of it, even though it was both deployed and retrieved in clean water. And then we also uh, noted that the test slick deer started in oil based on you know the cyclops reading, stayed in oil for uh, a number of hours until about nine or 10 that night and then drifted out of oil. And indeed it was uh, retrieved in uh, clear water, but it did get some oil exposure. So there, there was some uh, tracking of the uh, test system in oil. And then the, the results you can see are kind of mixed. Uh, we did a bunch of different controls that involved, you know, how the organisms uh, survived, you know, being shipped, uh, just our house controls. We collected some reference water and how they survived in the reference water. We collected um, site water in the contaminated area. We collected multiple grab samples and did some composite water. And then uh, the um, uh, organisms that were uh, left in the lab for 72 to 96 hours post exposure are the reference in the, the test sample. So uh, I guess what you could say is the survivability um, of the reference deers, uh, at least for the mice and shrimp, was was decent, um, but uh, the exposure did not indicate uh, toxicity with the juvenile mycids. And then, you know, with the top smelt larvae, we see lower survival even in the reference deer, but we know that the even those reference larvae were exposed to some degree to oil. So, um, you know, the results are mixed. We have a lot more of the findings in the paper. Uh, and by the way, this paper, we were 
this has been written up in a paper that is um, going to be, uh, it has been accepted in environmental toxicology and chemistry. So if you're a toxicity testing geek, you can see a lot more uh, charts like this. And, and we also uh, dose the uh, organisms uh, using uh, spiked uh, water column uh, PAH exposures too for comparative purposes. So a lot more findings in the paper. But uh, overall, our conclusions are that the deer system does allow for simultaneously real-time assessment of oil exposure and effects in the surface mixing layer. It did drip with oil. It uh, wasn't a perfect system that stayed 100% in the oil. Uh, the system was reliable and robust, and you know we're all happy to see it 24 hours later. We are happy to see uh, relatively high survivability in the organisms. Um, uh, the concentrations that were in the water column weren't extremely high, but we did expect to see some toxic effects. But the uh, you guys all know the Santa Barbara sea oil is is a very different kind of oil than what I'm used to seeing on uh, regular oil spills. Um, we learned a lot of lessons about what kinds of current predictions we should be looking at, um, test organism handling. Uh, we learned the importance of UAV support in the multispectral uh, use. So I think we could have probably done a little more with some of the surface mapping and uh, the drift overlays. Um, but overall, it's a really cool system, and I think we're interested in we've got funding to do more tests, ideally on a spill of opportunity. So we've got you know, a contract with Alan's group and a small amount of funding to deploy it somewhere else. Uh, so if you guys have an interesting spill in your region that you think would um, uh, benefit from some tox testing like this, just give us a holler uh, because we're just now setting up those contracts. And so we'd love to try it again and try to iron out some of the uh, tweak it a little bit to make it a little more robust.